great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hey, everybody. I'm Susan Lindner, your host of Innovation Storytellers, and we're going to do something really exciting today. We're going to take a look into the wild world of beauty. And for my male listeners out there, if you think this doesn't apply to you, you could not be more wrong because some of the most incredible innovations are happening in the beauty and fragrance space. And I guarantee you that the lessons we're going to be talking about today, both in storytelling and in technological innovation, apply to you. I am sitting here today with Shauna Weinblatt, who leads her team's mission to identify and roll out the most innovative digital-first solutions to enhance customer experience across all of Cody's brands worldwide. I'm talking about things like AR and AI and VR, ultra personalization. I mean, there's nothing more personalized than a beauty experience, not to mention machine learning and experiences with the metaverse. We are getting deep into (laughs) consumer tech today. Prior to this role, Ashana led global digital programming for a small brand, Calvin Klein and Marc Jacob Fragrances, where she spearheaded award-winning campaigns as well as held various positions at the Estee Lauder companies and Trish McAvoy. So if these brands aren't readily familiar to you, I guarantee you they are to all of the women in your life and probably also show up very readily in your stock portfolio as well. Well, Shauna has been driving these technological innovations at these beauty companies and allowing us to see ourselves in a very different light. So Shauna, welcome to the show today. I'm honored to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be chatting today about all things innovation and tech and beauty as it's a deep passion of mine. So very happy to be here. Thank you so much. All right. So let us inside the kingdom first. How did you get into this space? What was your path into the world of innovation? And I'll just say my last guest was like, I worked at Apple. I work at Intel. I hate the word innovation is how that conversation (laughs) started. And I was like, okay, take us on a ride. Where do we go? So how did you actually get there? And maybe that's the taboo word we should just stop saying. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think I still think innovation is a very strong word and it's only exploding more and more. But for me, it was kind of a happy accident. So when I first initially got my footing in digital, I I, I liken to think of it as like I was born into it almost when I was a kid and I when computers were like just starting to become very hot and I'm aging myself a little bit, but we were in these chat rooms, right? And like trying to figure out like, how do we get free music? And this was before Napster. And so I was always kind of Lime diving. Wire, into, baby. Like, Lime that's wire. right. That's right. <laughs> I was always diving into like the deep, dark parts of the web, right? Like looking for ways to find like the new things and the new innovations. And so we were like hand trading music at the time, like way before music being able to like go through LimeWire and Napster was a thing. And then from there, I just started to kind of look at like how to code a little bit, how to get, how to send my enemies viruses. Like back in the day, you just trying to, my favorite movie was Hackers, if you couldn't tell. Ah, look at that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it kind of came naturally. And then as I went into my professional career, so jumping ahead, we, this was at a time when MySpace and Facebook were just getting started. So when I was in college, Facebook had launched. We were when I was there, I was at BU. So we were one of the first people, one of the first colleges to have Facebook. And so when I started my career, brands were just trying to figure out, you know, how to build communities and monetize. And I kind of understood it right away. And so that's when I was hired at Trish McAvoy because she was like, I don't know how to, you know, kind of start this community and speak to my community and build content and do advertising in that space. Also e-com at the time was brands were just starting to get on board with that. So I helped build her e-commerce site. And while it was there, we actually, she was grossing, I think like $250,000 a year. And we grew it to like 2 million by the time I left. Wow. So I just kind of fell in. It was, it just sort of happened over time. 
And from there, I went to Lauder and then kind of the rest is history. And, and here I am today in, at Cody. So it's been a fun ride so far. Yeah. Give us a little background for those who don't know Cody. It's kind of hard as a woman to go like, okay, there's no one who doesn't know what Cody is, but for the, for those of us, cause we have a big global audience. So tell us a little bit about Cody. What should we know? Sure. So Cody's a global umbrella company for, it started really as a fragrance company. So I'm sure you heard of Calvin Klein fragrances and Marc Jacobs fragrances. So it, it, oh, it does license quite a few fragrances and that's kind of how Cody started. I believe it had its own fragrances for a long time, but now it, it, it most of the fragrances are licensed brands and some of the biggest, most luxury brands in the world, Gucci, Burberry. So there's a lot of them. And then we also have a consumer beauty business. So the consumer beauty business has brands like Philosophy, CoverGirl, Max Factor, Rimmel, Kylie Jenner, Kim Kardashian. So a lot Ooh. of well-known. Do we know those people? Who are they? We don't people? know them. They're never around. Them. I would like to offer a confession that I, I did go out with a man who told me that he was a Calvin Klein model, only to find myself walking into the main floor of Bloomingdale's and finding him standing there with a perfume bottle in hand going, would you like to try Obsession for Men? Oh my God. Like Obsession for Men. I'm like, you're a spritzer boy. That doesn't actually make you a Calvin Klein model. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, it sounds like he had the look anyway, so <laughs> He was trying. He was yeah, trying. exactly. That's so, so funny. So yeah, brands like CoverGirl and Max Factor, Philosophy, right? I mean, these are, and and there are um, men's colognes brands too, like Nautica, right? And others that we, that we all know as household things. Absolutely. Things. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So here we are in this space and we think, okay, so an innovation in the beauty space must be a formulation, right? Or maybe it's a cool new mascara brush. But that is not what you and I are talking about, right? We are talking about digital experiences and customer experiences and community building that hinges on some of the most cutting edge technologies in the world. Share with us a little bit about, A, some of the innovation that you're working on and how you get it from idea and conception to prototype and scale all the way till its finish line. Sure. So... For my role specifically, I mean, you're correct. There are a lot of innovations when it comes to product development and R&D, especially looking at like new formulations and, and things like that with products. But for me specifically, I am really focused into the tech experiences, but also being able to change the way that consumers are engaging with their brands from a digital perspective. So what that means, just bringing it down to actual projects, we recently established a partnership with Perfect Corp, who are the leading AR AI beauty tech company, I want to say in the world at this point. So I'm sure you know you've heard some of these other companies in the space. If you're in this world, like Modiface, et cetera, they are truly top-notch, best in class when it comes to virtual try-ons, skin diagnostic tools, foundation shade finders. So we established this partnership with Perfect Corp because we saw the the fact that there's so much that we need to do with our brands, especially given with what, what happened with COVID, right? You can't use testers. You can't interact with brands in a way that, that you would have in the past. Sometimes you can't even go into stores. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so these technologies unlock the abilities for our consumers to play with our brands and try new products that they never would have in the past um, and do it in a way that's safe and hygienic in either their homes or can be in store as well. So working with Perfect Corp, we are now rolling out all of these solutions across all of our respective brands globally. And wow. so this will be happening. Yes, we've already started. So our first solution has gone live with Sally Hansen, which is very exciting because- Nail polishes people. Nail polish. Yep. It's a first of its kind nail virtual try-on tool where, in, by, and by the way, I encourage everyone to go on to sallyhansen.com. It's on mobile only in the US only currently. But we will be scaling that out across our other key markets shortly. But essentially, it's a live image of your hand. So you can move your hand around and you can try on all different shades. We have about 200 currently, which will be adding more. You can filter the shades. You can do a before and after comparison. You can also download your images. So it's a very fun and immersive way, but also very first to market. So, wow. Exciting. Wow. On the show, we had the guy who invented virtual try on for Warby Parker. And I was so impressed. I went and got my own. And, nice. They look great. 
Thank you. But I'm really excited because every time I think the hardest decision I make over the course of a week is going into the nail salon and just staring in front of that wall of polishes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and trying to figure that out. But take us a little bit into this process because you and I love tech. And so is this virtual reality? Is this AI? Tell us a little bit about the back end, how you conceived of it, and then how you and your partner with Cody together built this so that the rest of us could avoid that agony and yes. joy of picking out the color of the week. Kudos to, to Perfect Corp. They created something called their Agile Hand Technology, which they had presented up to us as an opportunity to work together to create more of a Sally Hansen first experience. So the core of the technology really came from the Perfect Corp side, but the way that we branded it. So it was a collaboration between us, Perfect Corp, the global brand marketing team, and then all the different touch points along the way. So we're looking at integrating in stores. We're working with our our sales teams there. So it really is a cross collaboration between all the the main teams. But the idea is that we took this technology and really branded it to Sally Hansen and incorporated the brand codes, the brand voice, the functionalities that we knew our consumers would really want. So it, it, although it started with the core technology, our brand expertise and knowing our consumer engagement and consumer journey we combined the two together and really made this happen. So more to come because this is just the first pass. We're obviously looking at the data and analytics on the daily to best optimize over time, but that's kind of how we like conceived of it and then brought it all the way to the finish line. Tell us a little bit about the story that you told internally to get this concept approved, because do you think this would have happened outside of COVID or is this the trajectory that of with your vision of where you wanted to see Sally Hansen go? I think that it would have happened outside of COVID, but I think it would have taken a lot longer. Uh, I think COVID just escalated the need for digital so quickly. I mean, even you can see it even now with this whole metaverse, you know, industry that's booming. It, it, it went from basically zero to 60. And I, I don't think that we would have been pushing ourselves so quickly to do this in, in this manner if COVID didn't happen. Yeah. But, um, but this is where the silver lining comes in, right? It's it, There needed to be a shift in the model and the way that consumers were, were relating to products and be able to try them on. And especially with a category like nail, where it's so impulsive, right? We were talking about this yesterday. My global marketing team, like if you go into a CVS today... And you look on the like the bar of where the, the nail polishes sit, you'll see little like people will take the nail polishes and open it and like swipe on the counter to be able to see the color. Oh, I wouldn't say <laughs> I've done that, but I definitely yeah. can see a line of nail polish across the barcode. That's right yep. where the price tag is going. Is that really the red that I'm choosing or the berries are forever? Is it really raspberry? Is there a million more boys and berry? Because I need to yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and it causes a lot of, of waste and people opening the products and also damaging the counters. So, uh, you know, we're finding that it we need to do that. this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I won't tell them. <laughs> but that but said, right, good. there is, so when you, so clearly the need was felt internally already. So convincing executives, right? More senior executives about funding about this project, timelines, et cetera, around this project. It doesn't sound like, or maybe that was part of the issue. Was it, or was this a, let's do it, let's go, boom. Yeah. When we looked at the the state of the industry, to be honest, a lot of brands had already started this. So we knew that we had to kind of run quickly. Some have better technologies than others, but I think what we identified is that given Perfect Corp is the best in the space, we knew that if we solidified such a large global partnership, that this would just open up so many opportunities for us moving forward. So outside of just playing catch up with the virtual try-on and skin diagnostic tools that a lot of brands already have out there, what we're doing today is also looking at the market and understanding where are the white spaces that we can co-create together. Mm. So there's a lot that will be happening in the future that I can't talk too much about today. You'll come back. (laughs) But I will be back when those launch. But, you know, it's about really establishing ourselves as the leader in the market and doing that in a way that no one has done it before. So that's what we're looking at right now. So we're playing catch up, but we're also looking future first as well. So what's a stumble? Like where does stuff get stuck along the way when you're doing a big digital project like this? Because so many of us, 
would love to see our products take on a virtual experience for the consumer that they could actually taste it, smell it, feel it, touch it in a way that they get closer to the product and the brand every time that they engage. Where, what were some of the hurdles you had to overcome or what are some of the tough spots that in the process of implementing this? Sure. So the develop, I mean, the development went fairly smoothly. I will say the toughest part is to make this fully omni-channel. So integrating into our own sites or our D2Cs, because we have visibility into that and we know how that operates and we can work with the teams to do it correctly, we do that. But then outside of that, integrating into in-store, into retailer.coms, into social, this is where it gets really tricky. And we want this to be fully omni-channel. We want the consumer to have the same experience no matter where they are or what the touch point is. And it's difficult. The retailers right now, I think, are, are a little bit behind, some of them more than others, in the fact that having new technologies integrated into their dot-coms, they just can't take it. They're trying because to integrate. every brand wants to do that, right? Every brand every wants brand. their brand to show up on cvs.com and duanereed.com, et cetera. Correct. Even oh. having a QR code in store, we're finding that it's difficult, which wow. is the easiest thing. And then on social, what's amazing about Perfect Corp is that they have a really strong partnerships with most of the major social media platforms. But even socially, it's just they're just getting started in this space. So it, we'll, we'll get there, but there's a lot that still needs to do, develop and happen. So yeah. So what I guess what I hear you saying is that we have to begin to redirect people back to our own native websites in order to experience the most cutting edge technologies that are being applied to the brand. And that's a 10-year marketing shift, right? About finding these dispersed communities all over the web, across mm -hmm. social media channels, where people are living all day in Instagram. And then we're asking them to come back to home plate, right? We're asking them to come back to sallyhanson.com. That in itself is a customer journey that some might be reluctant to take, right? I mean, like it's a challenge to suddenly redirect people and say, we have a detour today. This is where the heart, the, but this is where the heart of the brand lives. Exactly. Exactly. For these technologies, yes. For now. Uh -huh. For now. But we are working very closely with our retail partners to understand how we can integrate these. I just, that is the challenge. It's the challenge today. So we'll get there. It just might take a little longer than expected. And how, as the lead innovator on this project, how does one begin to project the potential for return when you go to the board, when you go to the CEO and heads of, of different divisions and say, we're going to need to deploy people across the board in order to get this done. How does that conversation go? Yeah. So data and analytics are at the heart of everything we do. So we wouldn't have built these tools if we didn't have data and analytics to be able to back up and show the results and, and ROI across these tools. So what we've done is actually built our own internal analytics and data infrastructure. So that way, all the tools that we're deploying have a steady stream of data and analytics coming into one cohesive dashboard. And that way we can really look at each of the tools, understand how it's driving traffic, where it's driving to, and also where we need to optimize at the end of the day. Because we know the first round of these tools are never going to be the final, right? So as we see the consumer journey and where they are playing around with the tool, where they're dropping off, we can then make decisions on how can we better this over time. Wow. Yeah. And that for many companies, just getting the dashboard, right? Right. Yes. Is like just making sure you have the right piece. And so I imagine this is a giant investment too, right? And so making the case for that and then projected ROI from something like this. I had a guest on not too long ago who talked about innovation accounting. Mm -hmm. How we actually figure out the dollars and cents of something and the return on something that we don't even know if it's going to from jump, but it's a challenge right, to figure that yeah. out. Was that part of your kind of approval process internally too? It's figuring out the innovation accounting? Yes. And when we started, because we'd never done it before, it was it, they were more overarching benchmarks that we wanted to hit. Like we knew it drove conversion. We knew it, it drove higher basket size. And we, we knew that it, it decreased returns. Because that's been proven with these tools across the board. And actually what we found is that when we launched the Sally Hansen tool, we increased our traffic to our product display pages over 100%. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. And, we in, and we increased the intent to purchase by 120%. Holy moly. 
And that was organic. That was before we even pushed media. This was just, we launched it into the press and people found out about it. So we're actually planning to launch some media in the next few weeks. And I think we'll just see those numbers skyrocket, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. What an amazing feat. So, so this tool is one, but you know, something else we've talked about is this transition into the metaverse, which I'm fascinated by. There are so many people who are anti-metaverse, which I think has a little lingering feeling of like, (laughs) oh, Facebook, like there's like just the connection to it just makes us go, oh, what's it going to be like in there? And of course, media reports give us like, oh, there's, there's weddings happening in, in the metaverse. And is that what we want for humanity? Right. And then you catch like 30 seconds on the news and it's something like first case of sexual harassment in the metaverse, right? You're like, your avatar touched my avatar. Seriously? <laughs> like, can we not get away from this somewhere? Like, can the best of humanity show up somewhere? Right? But in a corporate context, can you give us a little bit of an overview about what you and Cody are thinking about how your brands will show up in the metaverse? Sure. So I, I know that there's different perceptions of the metaverse across different consumer segments and just different generations of the population. And when we look at the opportunities out there today, not only for businesses, but also just the population at large, I think what's amazing about the fact that everything is moving more decentralized, everyone is now a creator. And it gives these different generations of people the ability to feel ownership of the things that they're creating in a way that has never been done before. And I think this is a really exciting time for a lot of people who have felt kind of stifled by the back in the day. Now it's really opened up this amazing opportunity for people to not only create, but also it it creates this liberal economic drive where they can make money that they were never able to do before. And this isn't just in the US, this is also all around the world. You think about even in China, the opportunity for a lot of these young students are being employed now to do all these different types of activations in the metaverse. And they're able to put themselves through school. So there are positives of that. What's an example of that, Shana, of kids who are doing activations. And for some of our listeners who we're still conceiving of the metaverse, right? And I liken it to like, I think I remember this, it was called Sims. Like yes. you, right? I remember certainly there, there have been other iterations of the metaverse before. For sure. Um, now it's just coming from one of the biggest corporations in the world, as opposed to like small little video games companies who were trying to create new utopias for the rest of us. Right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, when, even when you think about The Sims, right, if you put that into kind of today's format, anybody can come in and create their own digital wearable goods. Anybody can create an NFT at this point. People are starting to have occupations within the metaverse, like training avatars or creating wearables for avatars. And anybody can do that. If you wanted to go and create a, a new line of hats for avatars and you wanted to sell them for a specific amount, you can go do that and no one is telling you not to. And you become your own kind of entrepreneur in the space, which is incredible for a lot of people. So- <laughs> I heard that the um, hottest real estate in the metaverse at the moment are mansions, mansions for sale <laughs> closest to Snoop Dogg and yes. his plot of land. <laughs> and yes. so I- I'm always going to say yes, yes to hip hop, anything. So, but so tell us a little bit, a brand like Cody, what are you thinking about in the metaverse? So it's interesting for brands because the appetite for brands isn't quite hundred percent there yet. And so there's a lot of different ways that brands can start to play with the metaverse. But I always say to my brands, like we have to be careful because the communities that are within the metaverse today are very sensitive and also very critical. So you never want to come out as looking like you're being an opportunistic brand or that it's a cash grab. You really want to center everything you do around your community and building brand loyalty and making them feel like they're a part of something that they would have never been a part of in everyday life. And that's, what's really cool about what's happening with NFTs and just these different activations is NFTs originally started as kind of digital art, right? You would buy it. Like I'm sure you saw with people, it was these really cool artworks. Now it's all about utility and about driving ways for people to feel that they're a part of something very exclusive. And you look at Board Ape Yacht Club and the way that they're developing their own metaverse today and the ape coin and the events that you get invited to, that's when we look at our brands, that's kind of what we need to start looking at and building versus just like dropping a product and hoping people buy it. Yeah. 
Uh, for those okay. of us who don't know ape coins, I'm one of them. <laughs> what do you think brands today should be thinking about it? Should should all brands, I mean, I can re- should all brands be in the metaverse? I can still recall in 1999, large companies saying, do I really need a website? Do you think that's important? <laughs> yeah. And I think where we are today, to be honest. Mm-hmm. This is a bit different. I feel like it's a bit more of the Wild West because there is so much ability for the communities to be speaking to one. If anybody you know that's listening in has ever been on Discord and you just look at the the chats that are happening every second of the day, these are people that are connecting on a personal level, not only about these brands and the projects that they're interested, in, but just about each other. And they're using it as a way to have a voice. So again, you want to really be sensitive with this community and all these communities that are being built. I think that there's a bigger appetite for luxury brands right now because of just the nature of that consumer. It's difficult to set up a crypto wallet. It's difficult to kind of navigate through this space at this point. It seems that the the brands that are, are doing it in the luxury space have already been in this space for quite a while. If you look at like Gucci and Burberry, you look at some of these other luxury brands, they established their positioning in digital a long time. So it feels more native to their consumers, right? Or the people that love the brand that they're here. And they're people who actually have crypto wallets and have been trading in crypto, right? I mean, it's a different echelon of, it's a different class, right? Of individuals, which is also very curious, right? Because Sally Hansen is a very day-to-day brand, but you deal with a portfolio of brands that range from drugstore all the way to highest luxury end. Yes. You also get to play with that expansion, right? And how we bring consumers along, regardless of their price point through this digital experience. Correct. So that's what we're trying to to navigate now, right? We we know the path for these luxury brands. What we want to understand is how do we bring the masses, right? And how do we get people to not feel intimidated by this space? And again, I think that there's a big differentiation between the East and West, In the East, this has been going on for quite some time, right? They started with avatars and gaming. China does this the best out of anybody. And it's and it's part of their everyday lives. So I feel like in in the East, it might be a little bit easier to kind of crack with with the larger population. The West, we're not quite there yet, I don't think, but we will be. It'll be interesting to see who kind of drives that charge and leads that. You know, Shana, I'm an anthropologist by training. And I remember going to a AAA meeting. AAA is the American Anthropological Association. (laughs) <laughs> not the folks who pick up your car when it gets stuck on the side of the road. Yeah. And I remember going to an academic conference and there was a speaker who was talking about the mascotization of Asia. And it was the embracing of mascots as part of brand becomes personality. And there was a subtopic within this called the cutification of corporate. And it was how all these amazing little avatars, we didn't call them that at the time, they were mascots, but people really embraced them and they felt a part of them, whether it be Hello Kitty or My Melody or all these different brands that um, were shown to us on the screen. It's probably a good 20 years ago now, but it, it, it harkens back for me, this understanding of why Asia finds it easy to embrace this metaverse concept, right? Or even this avatar-based concept, it was because it's been introduced from corporates who had cute little pandas and cute little, you know, koala bears as part of their corporation branding Mm -hmm. and their connection to the consumer from day one. And some really ancient brands that found that this is always how we've communicated through cute little animals that created a connection between us and a big, scary corporation, frankly. Yeah. Exactly. And now what we're finding is it's shifting that people are using avatars to personify themselves. So, and we're starting to see this over here as well. Now you can use an NFT as your profile pictures on a lot of social media channels. It's because people are really identifying with their digital characters, right? And what they're investing in or creating. So I can only expect that this just enhances over time that people are using this as a way of like having kind of this secondary life, right? Where I have my avatar who represents me, but then I'm also me at the end of the day, right? And bridging this digital and physical world. So it's like be Beyonce very- and Sasha Fierce there all coming go. together. At the same there you time. go. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, I was just like, at some point we had horoscopes that we thought would project a little bit of our personality. Now we get to craft the entire persona as an NFT and we can actually sell our own persona at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. 
We're getting quite philosophical, but it's helpful to kind of create this emotional grounding for how innovation leaders should also and digital leaders should begin thinking about how do we create this connection to our customers? And frankly, how do we bring our companies along? Cody is, from an American perspective, ancient brand for us, right? I mean, it's really one of the foundational brands of um of our time. So, and even as a holding company with so many brands beneath it, it has this range from something like Sally Hansen that we've known forever, all the way to what could be called the first avatar brand, the Kardashians, right? (laughs) I mean, they are avatars in their own right. And certainly Kim Kardashian had her own video game, right? And her own persona. You could play with Kim before you even saw a picture. What should we be thinking about as innovation leaders? I mean, there are a lot of B2B folks listening to us on this on this podcast, but what can we learn about how to bring the company along mm-hmm. into this digital space? How do we begin taking those steps? What should we be thinking about as innovators? So I will say that the, the first and foremost step that we have taken is upskilling education, right? Like I obviously understand this space very well and I'm a big NFT holder. I've a lot of them and I've been in this space, you know, for a few months, which is not long, but in this world, it is. In this context, um, <laughs> real estate, right? We talked about meta, yes. meta real estate at one point. So I think for just having the expertise or even having partnerships with people that have the expertise to allow your internal teams to really understand this space is critical. Mm. And I know it's not for everyone, right? We're not expecting a hundred percent everyone to be able to say, oh yes, I get it. But if we can get 50% of people within the company to at least open a crypto wallet, to at least understand the NFT market, to at least understand the infrastructure of how this is working, we're doing a good job. Because at the end of the day, you can't work on a project that you don't understand yourselves. Right. And so I think the upskilling piece highly critical that it's happening internally. And I think we're going to start to see like the shifts of ways of working. And we're so used to Teams and Zoom. I think that this is going to change a little bit over time. And I know for more of those traditional leaders, that's a scary thing to think, right? It was scary when COVID happened and we had to go remote. It's And I think at this point, it's embracing that change and not fighting it. Yeah. So it's understanding the space and embracing it and using it to better right? Your company, the way your employees are working, interconnectivity. I think there's going to be a lot of positives happening. And of course, there's always a lot of negatives. It's no different than when the internet started or when social media started. But I think that you have to understand it. At the end, of- What would be like a baby step of a, I would say like an experiment or a prototype engagement that maybe you undertook to see like, let's do a little testing of the waters to see what worked. I mean, clearly you had luxury brands to see what was already working elsewhere, but what would be a good way to start? Yeah. So a lot of our brands have their first footing was in gaming. And I think that's a great place because there's not a long-term commitment there. And it allows you to kind of seek out the space and see where the consumers are. And I, it depends on what the activation should be, but that to me seems like a bit lower barrier of entry versus trying to build a whole community from scratch. So I, I feel like the gaming industry is a really interesting place to kind of start and take a look at. Yeah. And that in itself can be a scary place. I say that as a son who majored in game design at RIT. <laughs> yeah. Those conversations yeah. alone, you try getting into a Dungeons and Dragons game and see what happens or getting into a world of Warcraft space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. what, I, what I tell my brands is it's very important to understand what are your objectives, right? What are your KPIs? And, and it shouldn't really be a moneymaker right away. It should be about just building brand loyalty and building brand conviction in the space, right? Why do I have the right to be here? So, and doing it in an authentic way. So that's like, first and foremost, what are your objectives? What are you trying to get out of this? That will then ladder into where should you, based off of your objectives, where's the right place to kind of take a step forward? Keeping in mind that there are challenges, right? It's not for everyone. It's not for every brand. You might fail. You might piss some people off along the way. So really taking into all of those pieces into account and understanding like, what is your roadmap? What can you see, like, hold up your crystal ball a little bit for us, Shana, because I feel like you are really at the edge of doing really cool stuff. What do you think is this buying space is going to look like in beauty for us over the next three to five years? What will our buying experience look like across the board without divulging too much of what's in your product roadmap right now? Sure. I think it's going to be interesting. I do think 
that beauty brands are going to find a way to bridge this physical and digital worlds. And I think that when you look at just the ways that even the metaverse fashion week that's happening starting tomorrow, actually on December. What? Metaverse fashion oh. week? Yeah. Oh so starting God. tomorrow in Decentraland, everyone can go. There will be the first metaverse fashion week. And there's a lot of major brands that are participating. Like Gucci, Pucci, Prada, Chanel kind of brands? That, not quite yet, but oh. but there's Ellie Saab, there's Etro, Dolce & Gabbana. I mean, there's some very notable, great brands that are participating this year. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. So when you look at that and that's already happening, right? They're building, what they've built in Decentraland is kind of this fashion road. So all these major brands can have like their established places. I think eventually that'll happen for beauty as well. There's going to be a positioning for beauty where people are going to come to a, a place in the metaverse to interact with specific beauty brands. And I can see beauty advisors becoming avatars, right? And actually giving advice one-to-one as your avatar and them. I think virtual trial will eventually be integrated in a certain way. I definitely think commerce is going to end up being integrated there as well. So at some point, you won't have to go to a Sephora. You can go to Sephora in the metaverse and be able to see all the products like you typically would. So it's going to be an interesting journey over the next few years, for sure. You know, it's funny when I'm giving workshops on, on innovation, I often, people say, well, I'm just breaking through. I, I don't have any competitors. And I often ask people like, well, who is Google's biggest competitor when they first launch? And nobody knows the search engines that preceded that. And I was like, well, yeah, it was the library. <laughs> I was like, the only difference was you actually had to put on pants to right. do it back <laughs> in the day and you won't have to do that anymore. And so exactly. we're really just headed to a pants free society. That's what I'm understanding is that we can pretty much try on virtually anything at home now. Yeah. So do you think, do you think that these head headsets that we have to use for VR are for virtual reality and that kind of expression at the moment are big hindrances to that adoption? I think those are for specific use cases. I don't think that's I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't ever see that being like fully adopted by everyone. To me, it's much more of a, there it has to be very specific as to why you're using those. I don't foresee like everybody kind of walking around with these things on their face forever. So I see like Mark Zuckerberg recently announced his partnership with Ray-Ban that they're coming out with these virtual reality sunglasses. Like that to me, maybe more, but we've seen Snapchat try to do this in the past with their glasses, right? And it didn't, it wasn't adopted. So or Google Glass, right? And everyone Google was called Glass. an asshole who wound up wearing their glasses. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think that there's going to be a limit a little bit to like how immersive it's going to get. But I think with the headsets, it's great for gaming and it's great for experiential if you're in the comfort of your own home. Yeah, so. I went to a museum exhibit and tried on one of those virtual reality goggles and I could fly like a bird. I don't do well on a roller coaster. I was screaming. I was like, I'm crashing in. I like crashed into the Grand Canyon in my virtual reality goggles. Like, this is terrifying. I'm not ready. It's very lifelike. I actually, so for, there's a company that we're speaking to and they, they are amazing. I can't tell you who it is today, but it's very lifelike. And they put me on the top of the Empire State Building or maybe it was the Chrysler Building. And I was like on one of the gargoyles and he's like, walk forward. And I'm like, no. He's like, nothing's going to happen to you. I'm like, I, my legs legit will not move. Like it feels like you're actually there and your stomach's in knots. It's crazy. Way too long. It's amazing what the human brain can do, right? It can actually project you there, yeah. which is why I pretend to do a five mile run while I'm just laying down in my bed <laughs> and hoping that the benefits will find them, find their way to me. Yeah, whatever works. <laughs> well, Shana, we're coming to the close. I want to, um, I'm going to put you on the hot seat if you don't mind and ask sure. questions around all things innovation. So in your mind, one of the top three, one of the top three, or whichever one you'd like to share, what do you think is the greatest innovation of all time? For like of ever his, of human history, tens of thousands of years, greatest innovation of all time. I think What's the internet, pick? the internet for sure. Yeah. Web. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what do you think if you could join any innovation team throughout the course of human history? Which innovation team would you like to be on? This is a tough one. I think probably Nike would be wow. one. You mean for the first running shoe ever? Just like over time. Oh, like it from history, like in the beginning. I like just I'm love what they're doing about now. Like the, 
the innovation team that put the wheel together, Mark. making a fire at the beginning of time. Oh my gosh. Whatever you'd like, but it's where you would want to be. It's what's exciting to you. Right. Right. So to me, the first innovation ever, I think it'd have to be something with like candy, <laughs> like figuring out like how to make like really good candy. That, what is that for like Ferrero Rocher or whatever, the ones that make like jawbreakers and Ferrero, like the old school candy makers. You'd like to be on that team. Yep. <laughs> And is there an innovation you would love to see in the market today? Like some problem that you wish, God, I wish somebody would solve this or like, oh, I cannot stand X anymore. Someone needs to improve that. Hmm. I mean, I think that there's going to be a really interesting way. So just like, and maybe this is not the best example, but I think that there's going to be a very interesting group of people that are going to start a consulting company to get people started in setting up crypto and like helping people kind of guide them through that journey. And I think whoever figures that out, like from like a basically like kind of handholding in a way, consulting, I want to say, whoever figures that out and can like monetize that will be a very rich person. So hint, hint to anyone listening to this call. (laughs) Yeah. The next Charles Schwab of crypto, that's going to be yes, yeah. sort of like that. Yes. But a little more like actually being able to, to walk them through it step-by-step step so they can figure this out. Yes. I guess. Yeah. Like a Charles or Schwab. the creator of the first crypto mutual fund. Yes. You and me, baby. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> Get rich. Shana, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to try on 200 shades of, of nail polish. Please do. <laughs> on sallyhanson.com. And I can't wait to have you back and we can talk about all the advances you're going to be making in the metaverse. Absolutely. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shana. Have a great one. All right. You too. <laughs> Bye. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlindner.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.